Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are finally doing it. We are going back to Kingdom Hearts 2. One of my top five favorite games of all time rests right in my hand. Now, many of you may be aware of this, but for those who aren't, just a couple of months ago, I played Kingdom Hearts 1 for the first time in many years since the 1.5 HD remix had come out and I was trying to check myself. You see, I've soured on the Kingdom Hearts franchise for years and I was wondering, do I still love it? And when I went back to Kingdom Hearts 1, there were things I appreciated, but overall I didn't walk away convinced that I still love it. So I thought it's only right that I go back to what I claim to be a top five game of all time and really see if I still have some adoration for this franchise. Here's the good news that Too Long didn't read. This game is still incredible, but I'm starting to realize I may be a Kingdom Hearts 2 birth by sleep guy, and that's really it, rather than just a Kingdom Hearts fan. I'll explain, but this was an absolute journey. I did a lot of brand new things in this playthrough. I saw end game content I've never done. I did proud mode. This was a big deal for me. So I have much to share today. Welcome one, welcome all. We have a lot to talk about. So thank you for joining me. If you're new here and you're into nostalgic and retrospective content, you're in the right place. Consider subscribing. Let's begin with the complete inbox experience. We'll put off this one to the side because actually fun fact, when I put this one in the overhead camera for too long, it actually the reflection from the silver will start to dim the lighting. So I have to be careful with when that's in shot. For now, we look at the 2.5 HD remix, which came with the collector's edition. This is a beautiful steel book. I can't stand that this label is here on the top because it ruins otherwise fantastic character art by Tetsuya Nomura. But on the inside, you get not only Kingdom Hearts 2.5, but you also get 1.5. That is the version that I played 2.5 for this video. It's on the disc that I don't have right now with me, which is the all-in-one package. So I played this on PlayStation 4. Now let's get back into that traditional OG groove here and take a look at a complete box copy of Kingdom Hearts 2 where it says, the story is not over. Encounter even more Disney heroes and villains. Travel to amazing worlds you've never experienced. Use powerful new techniques, magic, and combination attacks, as well as experiencing an adventure larger and deeper than ever before. And indeed, that's true. Comparatively speaking, I put about 40 plus hours into Kingdom Hearts 2, where Kingdom Hearts 1 was a sub 20 hour experience, which I thought was pretty nice. And it's funny because it shows that preferences matter because with Kingdom Hearts 1, I was getting that, all right, just wrap it up already type energy. But Kingdom Hearts 2, I was thinking, I don't want to walk away. Anyway, this complete box experience is awesome because on the inside, there was actually from the person I bought this from, a little receipt here. And I love finding these in my complete box copies because to me, it tells a story. So someone bought this game on April 6, 2006, uh, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 and they were ready to take the full dive for the series in Chula Vista, California. I don't know if this was the original owner or the owner beforehand, but I actually typically keep receipts from games that I inherit if they're in there. I just like the idea of the story there and seeing you know, someone many years ago picking this game up for the first time perhaps and wondering what could have been or was it a parent getting it for a younger kid? Who knows? But anyway, let's check out this manual. As expected, this is gonna be great. You have Tetsuya Nomura doing the art for this game, directing this game, so you know that it's gonna look really good, right? So we already have a nice border at the top. We love the stylized border with the stylized numbering, right? The Mickey Mouse ears with the numbers on the inside. You have little screenshots of different worlds in the background. All of this is great to see. Sora with the power stance, he's telling you to come at him. And then here we have a breakdown of the prologue. I'm gonna spare you all that because we're gonna go through like we did in Kingdom Hearts 1, world by world by world, and just I'll give you my thoughts on each one. Because in this case, it's really interesting because we are going to worlds twice in Kingdom Hearts 2. And I, I have some developed thoughts on that. So here we have the character page. You've got Sora, Donald, Goofy, King Mickey, Roxas. You got Twilight Town right in the background. Heartless, and if you look closely, you'll see in parentheses it says shadow, and you also have the nobodies, and in parentheses you'll see 
dusk. It's just funny how it's tucked in there. Organization 13, these are all important characters and enemies in the game. A lot of explaining going on here because they do drastically expand what Kingdom Hearts combat is going to be moving forward, or so you would assume until we had to wait a very long time for Kingdom Hearts 3, and then we got a million and one spinoffs, and you know the whole story by this point in time. So I actually thought the uh, combat breakdown was funny because it just says to press the X button, and I, I, found, I found this interesting because the combat in Kingdom Hearts 2 is great, but it's all really mapped to one button when you think about it for attacking. Again, I'll get more in depth in that because this is the first time I played on proud mode, so I appreciate some of the depth this game's combat has that I didn't think it did have. So let's keep going here. They go through limit forms as well as battle reaction commands. We know that was a huge part of Kingdom Hearts 2 moving forward. We have magic, and they have basic things here like fire. They describe Blizzard as shooting a wave of cold air in front of you, but obviously we know Blizzard shoots the, the crystallized diamond at an enemy, so I thought that was a little cool tidbit there to, to pick up on, the differences there. Abilities are obviously very important, especially with the late game power curve you get. I mean, man, do those abilities play a factor. Synthesizing items is still here. You have the world map the landing sites, the gummy ship. I asked last Kingdom Hearts video if people really dug the gummy ship. Is there anyone out there who goes, man, I love the gummy ship section, thinking I would get a rally of people going, yeah, it stinks. A lot of y'all like it, respect to you, I'm glad you do. Uh, here we have the gummy ship editor. They also go through the credits, and then here in the back is something kind of interesting, I thought, which is the Kingdom Hearts manga, and then a promotion for Disneyland <laughs> with uh, for a Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And then here on the back, promoting greatest hits, which I thought was interesting, because that's the order I went in. I played Kingdom Hearts 2, loved it, went back to one with the greatest hits, and I was like, this is, this is okay, it's not two, which then I went back and replayed a ton of times. So anyway, that's a complete box copy of Kingdom Hearts 2. Now let's talk about playing it in 2023. Is it truly one of Maddie's top five games? Yes, faith has been restored. So let's dive in a bit on a surface level and then we'll go deep into each planet. For starters, the gameplay itself is still really good. Like I love playing Kingdom Hearts 2 and getting into combat. The reason I make that distinction is I do think coming off of Kingdom Hearts 1, the exploration here isn't as great. To make up for that though, the end game content in Kingdom Hearts 2 is fantastic. So you're kind of just balancing the scales back and forth, but I will say I did miss the nifty creative exploration, the Trinity limits that Kingdom Hearts 1 had. I felt like there was more of a reason to double back to planets where here in Kingdom Hearts 2, they focused a lot on the story and doubling back in that sense. And I don't think it necessarily hurts the game, but it's something that I did miss a lot. And it did make me appreciate one aspect of Kingdom Hearts 1. You could break down Kingdom Hearts 2's levels to just hallways and hallways and more hallways. And in certain cases, like, you know, Disney Castle or Beast Castle, I would agree, but I think of places like Hollow Bastion that are really interesting to explore. It's just that there's none of those tucked away secrets that make you wanna double back. It's really just getting to the data fights and unlocking secret bosses, and I think that has its own charm. So both games have their strengths, but yeah, the power curve in Kingdom Hearts 2, playing this game in proud mode was a fantastic decision. I really was a doubter of that. My friend was insisting ad nauseum, he's like, Matt, the Kingdom Hearts combat has depth. I'm like, bro, it's one button. I don't need to have the dodge button and the and the the block button be a factor here. Like, it's such basic beat em up combat. It is not more sophisticated than that. Trust me, bro. Try it. I did. I was wrong. I gotta say, it was actually really nice. Developing skill in Kingdom Hearts 2 to some extent. Like, I usually never block because I'm always playing on normal and I'm just slapping everyone around and it's a really easy game and I just enjoy the fan service and the flashy combat. This was a time where I was dying, learning phases in these bosses, learning how to overcome them and retrying and retrying again. It was a good old school experience. So I do recommend if you've kind of been like me and neglecting that, give it a try. Am I saying go out and do a like critical mode? No. No, that's for psychopaths, but proud mode is that good in between. Although I know there are a lot of people who don't respect proud mode. I don't get it, but I, I personally, hey man, I liked it a lot this way. I was actually timing my blocks right. I was paying attention to boss attacks and it felt very satisfying eventually coming out on top. So, you know, tip of the cap to Kingdom Hearts 2. Quietly 
deep combat system here. And eventually I was tailoring my builds to certain bosses. I was changing my ability loadouts, and I really loved that at the end game. Again, something I never had to do, picking specific combo enders, trying to match them up with what stats I'm building towards. Felt like a true RPG. Again, not something that I said Kingdom Hearts wasn't, but not really the focus for me. So I really uh, stripped away the ignorance in this playthrough. That was nice. You know, the performances in this game are, I think, the best Kingdom Hearts has ever seen. You know, especially for Sora, Haley Joel Osment's performance here, it, it just, it cannot get better than this. You know, I think you have the perfect balance of Sora here of naive, but believing in people, but also determined and not just as stupid as he eventually becomes in the later games, man. Like they made my dude into a fool. So I'm hoping they get him back to his his wise sensei level Sora and not this guy who's stumbling around like, huh, what was that supposed to mean? Like in Dream Drop Distance and whatever. Again, the game that just started to really sour me on the franchise. But Haley Joel Osment, like his performance here is fantastic. Everyone across the board is fantastic. And let's get into it a little bit, right? I have much more to say on the gameplay in the terms of end game content, but let's go progressively through the game together. So starting off, we're in Twilight Town. This was one of the parts I was wondering, will it age well for me? Will this long two to three hour stretch where you're playing as Roxas and we're methodically building up Twilight Town's story, Roxas' story, is it gonna hit right for me? I gotta be honest, this did hit right for me in a very coincidental manner. As many of you know here on Retro Rebound, one of the game series we've been working towards catching up on is Final Fantasy, although I, I haven't done a Final Fantasy video in a, a while, but I promise that, that Final Fantasy VIII video is coming. But anyway, what was really nice is going through Twilight Town and really the whole game and uh, appreciating the amount of Final Fantasy callbacks I saw here. Cypher from Final Fantasy VI, there was so much Final Fantasy VIII representation. You got my man, Vivi. Final Fantasy IX is my favorite. Of course I knew he was there uh, in the first place, but I remember growing up thinking Vivi was just a heartless and, and now knowing Vivi is like this awesome character for Final Fantasy IX, it just meant a lot more. So it's, it's very sad this whole story stretch, uh, you know, knowing Roxas is eventually gonna fade away. Uh, but I will say in like your 15th playthrough, you, you know, you want some aspects to speed up. It's really when you're farming money and go on a little trip with your friends and then you're doing the seven wonders of Twilight Town. It's just that part of the game, it's so important and it's good for nostalgia and you do like it, but you know it's like a tough recommendation for those who are going through it for the first time. So for me, Twilight Town hits in its emotional highs. It hits when it's finally rolling. I did love the Final Fantasy representation hardcore here, uh, but man, I was really missing Sora by the end of it. Finally, they delivered. So once they deliver, you get to Yen Sid's tower. Highlight here for me is getting the new outfit. They play Sora's theme, which is one of my favorite tracks in the whole game. You see the outfit on. This is Sora's best look as well. I think in Kingdom Hearts 3, they gave this man like this tight haircut that I just don't like. I enjoy Sora's look a lot in Kingdom Hearts 2 as well. Not even because I grew up with it, just the size of his clothes are ridiculous, but still awesome. I love, again, the hair and how wild and unkempt it is. He's very anime, but like innocent. I don't know, like there's something about the look in Kingdom Hearts 2 that speaks to me. So when they're going through all of his outfits, it was also nice because you see like the green rendition, the red rendition, and then you see, bang, the black outfit. You're like, that's my man's outfit. Excellent choice here. Wish it stayed in Kingdom Hearts 3, uh, but I understand why they wanted to change it again. Just this is his best look. All right, so now we get to Hollow Bastion. Hollow Bastion is a planet that I, I gotta say is easily in my top three in all of Kingdom Hearts. Like, I don't know how it couldn't be because now I understand going Kingdom Hearts 1 and then so soon after Kingdom Hearts 2 and really paying close attention to absolutely everything as a young adult. I love the scale of this world, right? I love when you're in Kingdom Hearts 1, you're really in the castle, but in 2, you're in the outskirts and you get to see the castle in the distance, like in the part where you find Sephiroth waiting for you. You can see the castle in the distance. I just love that stuff. And the lore behind, you know, Hollow Bastion, that is something I really wanted to get into here because one thing I was wondering with two is, is this where the story starts to get convoluted with the nobodies, the heartless? And I gotta say, there really wasn't any confusion. I think 
it's really not until they do the bunch of spin-offs that Kingdom Hearts lost all sense of what was going on. But, you know, with Kingdom Hearts 2, I really got to say I wasn't too confused. You know, I really love the idea of Sora incidentally aiding the nobody's plans and the nobody's purpose as well is quite sensible. I think the biggest flaw of it all is really when we start to get deeper into the series and Sora gets like 18 versions of himself, right? You have Ventus, his Keyblade Master. You have Roxas, his nobody. You have Heartless. You have uh, the, the Sora who's evil from Birth by Sleep, whose name I'm forgetting right now. There's a lot of Soras, and I think that's where it's an easy sticking point. But otherwise, didn't find this one too hard to track and really love the overall narrative here. So Hollow Bastion really opened me up. I, I just loved the start here. It was like the adventure truly began. Now, you have the choice to go to one of two plants. You have Beast Castle and you got Mulan. Now, normally for me, I'm just picking like, hey, what makes the most sense for me and my taste because I don't have to worry about difficulty. Didn't think that through here. Went to Mulan for the first round. Probably a mistake. Got my butt kicked bad here. Should have went to Beast Castle, but my favorite heartless boss is here, so I, I didn't want to wait. But I love the story of Mulan in general. Uh, I think it's, it's fantastic. I love how it fits into Kingdom Hearts. The music here is awesome. The scale of this planet. I mean, I remember being really wowed as a kid, just all the places you can go. And that was kind of the best part about doubling back to these planets. But what I noticed with Mulan versus other planets in Kingdom Hearts 2 that we'll get into is sometimes the doubling back was considerably weaker. Like I found myself very invested in that first half and then when we had to go back to the same planets twice, there were some that I just wasn't feeling. Mulan wasn't one of them. Again, this Heartless boss in the second phase is awesome. And I look at Kingdom Hearts 3 where they only did Heartless bosses and I go, how did you not figure it out, man? Like, come on, I'm not even a Kingdom Hearts 3 hater, but like, I get you didn't have the Disney bosses, but I look at this one, this is epic, mechanically deep, fun, awesome boss fight here. Anyway. You eventually make your way to Beast Castle or vice versa, depending on how you start things off. This is also one of my favorites. I, I love the exploration here. I love the story of Beast struggling uh, because it makes a lot of sense when you carry over from Hollow Bastion in Kingdom Hearts 1 to here in Kingdom Hearts 2. But perhaps the thing that stood out to me the most here was my man Zaldin. My man Zoldan just whooped my butt again. I was like, okay, wow, proud mode, how you doing? Yeah, Zaldan is a toughie, a tough, tough, toughie. And that's not even accounting for the data fight in proud mode, but he will whoop you. Now, what's awesome is you get the chance to play as King Mickey here. I don't know the answer to this. Maybe someone can let me know down below. Why is it only this part and, and very few others where Mickey appears, but maybe it's because this boss is extremely tough. I just like that you eventually get to play as Mickey in this stage of the world. But otherwise, uh, you know, one thing that always cracks me up is like, is like moving the dresser out of the way of the door when it's asleep and it's like a mini game. I remember as a kid mashing the reaction command and accidentally waking it up and being so confused. Uh, but yeah, Beast Castle, really works for me. So we're rolling here. Now, eventually you go back to Hollow Bastion and you see the book getting stolen. These thugs known as the Heartless dare to steal Winnie the Pooh and they also steal <laughs> all the pages. Uh, so you know what's funny? Confession, never really got around to collecting all of the pages for Winnie the Pooh. I know you kind of like squinting at me, what a top five game. I got some weird confessions with this game. I don't know, just again, I always claim that like something was off with me growing up. Like I didn't have that itch to go deep. I think I was just very easily satisfied. So I just kept rinsing and repeating things. But for example, uh, 2.5 comes out. And when it comes out, I'm like, oh my God, finally, final mix in the US. I put like 30 hours in and then drop the game for a birth by sleep. What is wrong with you, Maddie? Come on now. Anyway, back to on track here. Winnie the Pooh finally completed it. You know, what what happened in Kingdom Hearts Three? Why did this Why did this turn into Candy Crush? Like this was such an endearing part of the game. The OG voice actors across the board are here. It's wonderful. It's comforting. It's kind of sad in the so end when you. you finally restore Pooh's memories. He knows who you are and he's like, you know, I don't want you to go pretty much. And and then Sora's like, Pooh, I'll always be here. I know some people clown on the scene because it's like, ah, ha, ha, you know, Sora's bonding with a bear in a book. What a loser. But look, that's part of the charm. Kingdom Hearts is about friendship. It's about a lot of other things. 
and that are very confusing at times, but it's about friendship at the end of the day. So when I see those friendship moments reprised very well, you know, it pulls a little emotion out of you. So I really liked Winnie the Pooh this time around. Now, Olympus Coliseum. Y'all know how I feel about Final Fantasy X famously. Orin being one of the bright spots to me. So I gotta say, really like Olympus Coliseum. This was my first encounter with the absent silhouettes. I must have just missed this in 2.5. I'm not even front. Like, I just must have missed this when it came out on PS3 because I tried it and, and wow, I, I love the boss fights in Kingdom Hearts 2 on Proud Mode. Like, I really love that I had to study every single mechanic to just get it right. Some of you may scoff because you're better than me. Fair play. You can laugh at me. It's okay. Let, let me be the idiot here because I'm just figuring all this out, really. And I so appreciated, like, for example, when he turns you into the book, he turns your party members into the book in this absent silhouette boss fight in Olympus Coliseum. I'm not gonna pretend to know the name of every single nobody, but this one was awesome because each one has like their own gimmick, their own mechanic and mini game attached to it. So this really just started to shine a light. Oh, this game is special. This isn't just any kind of game. Cause like, for example, I don't think it's a hot take, but I think that Kingdom Hearts 2 has one of, if not the best action camera ever. Every action camera is gonna mess up sometimes, you're gonna clip into a wall or whatever, but its placement is beautiful and it's perfectly highlighted during boss fights where so much is going on and I still can track the action. Whereas Kingdom Hearts 1 was the opposite. It was like right against Sora's back and I just felt the game was so tight and rigid. Kingdom Hearts 2 is just like a wave in the ocean, baby. It's awesome. Anyway, Olympus Coliseum. It was nice to, to be screamed at by Phil to get up on the Hydra's back for the millionth time. That was nice, but a planet that I really loved in this game, and I want to see more of this in Kingdom Hearts 4, is actually Disney Castle, or really Timeless River. The reason for that is I loved the art and sound change here. This, to me, really defined the planet. It almost took the focus off the story, which really wasn't rolling too much here, and turned it into this silent cartoon almost like even the way Sora talked even during combat it was kind of muted and distorted I love this change here it reminds me a bit of actually during Kingdom Hearts 3 when you're in uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean world I love that change because when you're playing Kingdom Hearts 3 it looks a certain way and then you get to Pirates and you go this is one of the best looking games I've ever seen what is this what's going on here I love that shift to realism. To me, it really lit my fire. Not everyone else's, but I dug it big time. So it reminded me of that. And I gotta say, outside of those cars, those frustrating car enemies, Timeless River is also one of my favorites in this game. Just awesome to be back here and awesome to see them change the art style, the sound, really good stuff. Now, then we get to the next planet, which I call who invited bro the world. Like he just wants to be a part of the team, right? That is Atlantica. Skip, 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 skip. Every cutscene, skip, 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 skip. Mini games, da, 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 da. I'm just here for the trophy right now. I'm just here for the trophy. Give it to me. Okay, thanks. Goodbye. Otherwise, sayonara. This planet is awful. I don't want to hear any defense of it. Moving on. Pirates of the Caribbean, speaking of which. Uh, this one scared me growing up. You know, you had these undead pirates. I was surprised that, you know, Disney kind of let this one slide. Like, you even had blood in this one. Like, there was a point where someone slashes their hand and bleeds over all of the, uh, the, the, the gold in the chest. And I'm thinking to myself, huh. No wonder I was kind of terrified as a kid. Like, between that and the look of the pirates when they're out in the moon. Very terrifying. This is where I think Kingdom Hearts 2 veers a bit with its boss design at times and especially some of its planets into a gimmicky kind of game like i really do dig pirates of the caribbean but waiting for the moonlight on a tougher difficulty just feels like a lapse in design like why is this a mechanic not because i hate the mechanic but just why are we doing this when it's clearly not going to work out for the higher difficulty levels. Like just waiting for a pirate to step into this sliver of moonlight to knock them up with a combo. And then the second I'm slapping them around and I hit them into the shadow because I'm destroying them, they go back into their human form and I can't hit them again. Make it make sense. Like all we had to do was make it where when you hit the enemy, they just stay in that zombie form or whatnot. I just don't like this mechanic at all. And uh, this boss on the return with the medallions just, it stinks, man. So 
while I did like Kingdom Hearts 2's uh, Pirates of the Caribbean as a kid, like it was tolerable, I didn't like it the second time around. In fact, I'll go to the length of saying that Kingdom Hearts 3 blows this one out of the water. You get to ride around on your boat, you get to have awesome combat, it has that realistic art style, I mean, I think it's fantastic, personally. So, so Pirates for me didn't do too well both times around. Aladdin! Why didn't I remember this part of the game? Like, when I fired it up and I got to Aladdin, you know, I was streaming it to my friends on Discord, I went, what? Aladdin's here? They're like, yeah, bro, don't you remember? No? I don't know if Aladdin is an optional planet, but I know there's one planet in this game, uh, Pride Lands, that is optional, and that one was also new to me, and I think as a kid, what I did was, again, I'm just satisfying my needs here. So I probably skipped after the first time because I know exactly what would have bothered me about Pride Lands. But anyway, Aladdin... It's, uh, there. <laughs> it's there. The carpet sequence, right? This is where the gimmicks are a strength or weakness depending on where you lie in it. Like, I asked last video, does anyone love, for example, the gummy ship? And people were like, yes, I do. And I think Kingdom Hearts 2 just leans in that more. Like, each planet has its own gimmicky reaction commands, battle mechanics, and sometimes they work out fantastically. Other times, they just don't and i didn't really dig the whole carpet mechanic because it removes your party and i like when sora's got the full party when he's just by himself it just doesn't feel right to me and with that we move into halloween town still the top kingdom hearts world this is so good still the goat for kingdom hearts worlds i mean from the the Keyblade you unlock here, which is busted, use that pretty much the entire game, moving on from there, all the way to the boss fight with Oogie Boogie, to the, the scenery, the storyline here. It is beautifully done, meeting Santa Claus, and you go into like a Christmas town. Speaks to the soul, man. As a Christmas fan, as a Halloween fan, as a Nightmare Before Christmas fan, like this world rocks. I would love to see it back in Kingdom Hearts 4. I really would. I think there's no coincidence that both times this gelled hard. It just is a part of the Kingdom Hearts DNA where it's just so weird and random and fun. It just evokes all that Disney energy to me. So yeah, Halloween Town, still the goat. We take our talents over to Pride Lands. Remember when I said I didn't really remember this one? This is another gimmick that I'm not crazy about. When you change Sora's form, I'm talking about you, Atlantica, I'm talking about you, Pride Lands. While Pride Lands is a little more tolerable, when you take away his original form, you take away a ton of abilities, you change the whole build, you strip all the RPG mechanics out, and while it's there and it's fine and you can get through it, it just, to me, makes the game feel a little stagnant. I'm just like, man, I, I wanna have my build my Sora, because he's already got a million and one forms and summons. I like the idea here, and I get the thought process of, huh, it'd look kind of weird if human Sora was running around the Pride Lands. And there is a cool idea here of, like, the openness and kind of free roaming, you know, these big wide open areas. I do like the idea here, but yeah, Pride Lands didn't really click, because I think it just highlighted something I don't also like with Atlantica. And that especially was so in, in the first Kingdom Hearts game. So from there, you know, depending again on the order you go in, it will differ from person to person. I ended up going back to Twilight Town, you know, you learn that Axel is starting to disobey orders and uh, be a little unruly. Love to see that because you're, you're starting to see the connection between Axel and Roxas and that's obviously extremely important to the storyline here, both short term and long term uh, for the entire series. Uh, but it's really when you go back the Hollow Bastion, right? That second time around, you're preparing for the peak, is what I call it. And you're you're getting ready to pay your dues. So you see the Final Fantasy Ten Two reference here? Uh, this one spoke to me a little bit more as I'm planning to play that very soon. You see Cloud and Tifa in their Advent Children outfits. Love to see that. But like I said, this part is all about paying your dues. What do I mean by that? Because... After this, you have what I like to call part three of Hollow Bastion, the peakest of peak in Kingdom Hearts 2. Before that, though, you gotta do Tron. Now, I know some of you may say, I like Tron, and some of you may think it's cool. But look, they had the audacity to do this world twice, right? You have it here. You have it in Dream Drop. And I think in Dream Drop, it's a little more tolerable. There's great music here. 
but I just, I just think it's because it's right before a part I love that it's like testing my patience every time. Because the way they actually interweave the story with the DTD, the door to darkness, and create and finding the password to access Ansem's data, like the way they actually interweave Trine into the main Kingdom Hearts 2 narrative is genius. It's I appreciate it. It's just that it's positioned terribly. I just want to get to the peak. So pardon my impatience here. Tron, like you're a planet I want to love, but you're just in the way. Get out of the way. Let's talk about Hollow Bastion Part 3, right? Hollow Bastion Part 3, this is where it all goes down, right? So you learn about Ansem, right? The main villain of Kingdom Hearts 1 is a heartless, but he wasn't actually Ansem. But meanwhile, Xehanort's nobody is the leader of organization of organization 13. So it's it's starting to get a little confusing for some. But there's a moment for me where the gears turned. I was kind of just like, okay, anyway, where's my next world? But there was a moment the gears turned, and it was when you got to the world that never was. We're gonna skip ahead for a brief moment here. It's 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 so so sad. Please have pity on me. This is so sad, but I didn't realize until this moment in the game where you see Roxas's name is actually Sora with an X. God help me and my oblivious nature. I wish I was kidding. I wish I was yumming it up right now for some great content, but God help me. I did not know this. And when I saw that, suddenly everything about the nobodies just started to click. Like, Xemnas is Ansem with an X. Oh my God, the face palm I had. I wish you could have been there to see the disappointment in myself. Now, let's hop back a little bit here because I don't want to skip over the peak, but this is where, again, things start to come together with who's nobody is who, why they exist, and their purpose. Now it all feels purposeful when before it just felt needlessly complex. So I appreciate the story of Kingdom Hearts 2 a lot more this go around. Now, anyway, leaping back into Hollow Bastion, here we go. Rising Sun, the goaded reaction command as you participate in the battle of a thousand heartless. What is there to say about this that hasn't been said? I don't know other than this as a kid was so epic. The music is going hard and this is the one time being alone with Sora rocks. As you are just mowing them down left and right, I get so hyped every time I'm back here. It rocks. And at the same time, you got like a hint at Goofy dying. I'm just like, man, this this is some rock hard stuff right here. And all of the Final Fantasy characters teaming up just speaks to the soul, right? Because that is where this game is at its strongest, right? You start to feel like, this is what we want, Square. This is what we want, like Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy teaming up, right? Having their own big moments. It is absolutely epic. Like watching Cloud and the main character from Final Fantasy VIII, who I'm gonna get to know pretty shortly, teaming up was so cool. Uh, just really, 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 really appreciate this moment here. One of my favorite in all of gaming, especially because Maleficent eventually saves you. So anyway, you finally make your way to the world that never was. You have that Roxas boss fight, that Zigbar boss fight. You have Sora and Riku reuniting. Riku's now a party member. Oh man, what the heck is going on? It is just sprinting at a rapid pace here, but it is so, so nice. That Roxas boss fight is kind of sad though. Uh, and especially because you start to hear that Roxas kind of barks a bit when he when he does attacks. He kind of goes like rough, like rough. It's interesting, but I digress. The Zigbar boss fight, this thing is tough. Now you gotta get Ruflega on a little bit here. If you don't, you know, you'll be like me and you'll see me getting punished left, right, and center. But that is where, again, the beauty of proud mode shows because you have to really start experimenting here. Now, Sora finally is able at this point in the game to fulfill his promise to Kairi. So after finishing the final boss, which was epic again, I especially love the part where you're surrounded by lasers and they're coming down from all angles. 
I, I don't know if any of y'all had the same problem. I died a couple of times here as a kid because I was only hitting triangle, thinking that's all I had to do. But you have to go back and forth to triangle and X. Something I will never forget moving forward. But as a kid, I was wondering why I kept dying there. I'm like, I'm mashing triangle. What's going on? You had to do X as well because I think that one was mapped to Sora. But anyway, finally, you beat the final boss and you get to reunite with everyone. This is where the feels come out, right? Because at first you think they're going to be stranded in the realm of darkness. Little fan theory here. Thought it would have been kind of cool to leave them there because they, again, kind of tease like they're setting up that Kyrie is going to be this big MC at one point in time, but they never commit to it. And I thought it would be really cool if Kingdom Hearts 3 was actually about Kyrie saving Sora and Riku. And then obviously the rest of Kingdom Hearts 3 story plays out, maybe in a more condensed fashion with a little less bloat, but I digress. You know, that would have been awesome. I thought they were teasing that, you know, when I was looking at it, thinking maybe this is where they were going with it. But anyway, they reunite. Sora finally delivers on his promise. And that's it, right? That's the story. And you think like, man, can't wait to play the next one. And then <laughs> what was it like 14, 15 years later, here, here they were with Kingdom Hearts 3 finally. So now the game is done, right? And I lean back in my chair and I go, okay, I'm on board. I love Kingdom Hearts 2, that's for sure. Now it's time to do what I've never done. Let's explore that end game content. Let's see what it is all about. So I start off by grinding up my forms because your man needs the high jump, he needs the glide because I pretty much need to get into an area I've also never ventured to before. That place being the Cavern of Remembrance. When I stepped in here and I heard this track, Oh, Lord, have mercy. I was like, my ears, my ears, my ears. What have they just been treated to? I need to do everything I can to spend more time here. So I start grinding those forms up. Kind of a pain. More than a pain, actually. Uh, you know, especially some of the things you had to do were absolutely ridiculous. Like the wisdom form grinding was just a, a complete headache. Master form wasn't too bad because I used some of the the card enemies in Yen Zid's tower. Not too bad, eventually you get to a rhythm, but wisdom form, I was going back and forth to Timeless River. It was just, wow, old school, wow, old school. Because what I do is I go to do the wisdom form in Timeless River, then I double back, I'd go to Olympus Coliseum, I'd recharge all my limit forms by starting up a specific cup. I think it was the Pegasus cup. Then back in, I go again to Timeless River over and over and over and over and over. That was the worst one. Like I even tried Mulan because I looked up some videos online eventually. Finally get through all the form grinding. Now we're good to go. We're already leveled up a pretty decent amount. I do all the absent silhouette boss fights. I just really appreciate that they're even here. This is an awesome component of the game. But to me, what was the defining moment, my crowning moment in this game was beating Sephiroth. This was my final boss. I know there's one more we're gonna get into beyond the data fights, but this was my final boss because I stopped by this dude every 10 levels up until probably like the high 60s and was trying to beat him. And he just kept whooping me no problem. He went, that's enough. And he'd get me. And it was just such a struggle, not that struggle from the beginning of the game, but a struggle truly to overcome this foe. But the scream I let out when I finally beat this man, oh, did it feel good. But it was rewarding because it actually reminded me of my experience with a FromSoft game or early any game with deep boss mechanics where I had to know his pattern from top to bottom. And when I beat Sephiroth, you could see it was borderline flawless. It was like one of those moments where you were just one with your video game console and you were locked in unlike anything else on this planet. It could, someone could be screaming bloody murder in the room over, doesn't matter, I got a boss fight to finish here. That was the type of engaged I was having right there. And oh my word, did it feel good to come out on top. So afterwards, I'm feeling pretty good. I get all the way through the Cavern of Remembrance from this point forward. I get to the data battles. Oh gosh, man, I thought I was so good at this game, but I was wrong. So now you need to level up. You need to go back to the world that never was and start grinding your levels. And I couldn't do it at that point, man. I'm 45 hours deep. I'm like this plus the, 
the Ultima Keyblade. I just can't justify this type of grind. And again, this is where like the gimmicky nature of form grinding, level grinding, and getting the Master Keep. I just, I just couldn't justify at that point. But I had to try just one time because I remember as a kid watching the data fights online, trying lingering will. Had to see what it was all about because that was why I wanted 2.5 so bad to come to the West because I remember when I was a kid, I turn on YouTube and I would watch these data fights, these lingering will fights constantly and just be so envious of people. I never got to experience it. So finally I got to have my taste and it was over in a flash. It was over in a flash. Now I know there's some cheese to beat lingering will did not do that. I did not participate in these heinous acts. I walked away because I had had enough at that point, but I will say that I want to come back when I'm refreshed and recharged and maybe try to get the rest of the levels and go for it. I would probably go a little bit further if Kingdom Hearts 2's Platinum wasn't absolutely gross and didn't require an absurd amount of grinding, but I still really appreciated doubling back to this game. So that's my adventure of Kingdom Hearts 2 in 2023. From top to bottom, I love this game. It's a little gimmicky at times, Doubling back to some planets narratively was weaker, but overall, I love Kingdom Hearts 2, and if you've not played it, I mean, that 60 FPS goodness, when you were there on the PS4 version, whew, nothing quite like it. Excellent combat system, underrated depth, great character building, awesome emotional moments, just really appreciate this game a lot. So that's where I stand on Kingdom Hearts 2. I'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts down below. Fire away, and I will catch you in the next Retro Rebound Peace out.